Sir, uh, Dr. Silva, you can hear me? Yes, sir, I can. I can hear you, sir. Clearly? Yes, sir. Very clear. Okay. I'll start the class another... Uh, two I, I was not sure about my... No, sir, I can hear you loud and clear. Yeah. Yes. Is the screen visible? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. Screen's visible. Moving. Moving. Yes, sir. Okay, good. So, so I think we can. Wait for a few minutes. So let me see what out there.
Good evening, everybody, today, and welcome to today's session. Um, uh, uh, we have with us today Dr. Paul from Community Medicine Department, and he'll be taking a class today on infectious diseases uh, epidemiology. Over to you, Paul, sir. Okay. So, good evening, everybody. I think it is a very uh, unusual time for a class. All of you must have had a full day in the ward or the department in the lab, and then you have to come back again for a a lecture, I don't think it is a very um, pleasant experience. Anyhow, we have a program, so we better make maximum use of it. So I will discuss a little bit about the infectious diseases epidemiology. And I'm sure almost all of you would have learned this in your undergraduate days, or probably is still using it while doing your PG, and is familiar with most of these terms. So this session will be mostly a kind of a revision. And uh, I will be glad if you can interrupt me and ask questions if you have any, any in between. Don't wait for my talking to stop because that is not the purpose. Are you, anyone who is, I mean, who's having any doubts or any comments, please feel free to interrupt me and ask me questions or add anything to what I am saying. So this is like the important concepts and commonly used terms in infectious diseases epidemiology. So a clear understanding of this is important and will be useful because when you're reading any books or when you're talking or when you're hearing someone, you know, those who are using it should have a clear understanding about what they're talking about. And those who are listening also should know exactly what it means. Because sometimes we use terms a little casually, you know, infection, you know, I suffer from an infection. Even sometimes we doctors also use those kind of terms. So it is best avoided, at least when you're talking in formal you know, situations or when you're dealing with any technical aspect of it. So we will, let us see which other one. So infection, we start right away with the term infection. So the definition of infection is entry and uh, development or multiplication of an infectious agent in the body of man or animals. Of course, we are concerned with man, but the same thing applies to animals also. So as you all know, infection does not always cause illness, but sometimes we use the term infection synonymously with uh, disease or you know, illness, which is not very correct. So infection is a specific condition where there is entry and development of and multiplication of the organism, but it may or may not lead to uh, disease. And we are more worried about the disease part rather than the infection part. Normally, we expect a, when, some, when an agent, microbial agent, enters the body, the body will respond to it, mostly by producing antibodies or some other, other protective measures. Again, there is no uniform process to describe the infection because the response or the type of response or even the lack of response depends on the host, you know, how the host reacts to the entry of the microorganisms. So you can uh, classify the infection into four types, a colonization, subclinical or in apparent infection, and latent infection, and clinical infection. Okay. So the, the first one is colonization, like you have the organisms in the body, in the skin or nasopharynx or in the intestine or wherever it is, you know, a lot of organisms in our microorganisms in our body. In fact, uh, some people say the number of microbes in the body, mainly in the intestine and the skin and other places, are more than the total number of cells in our body. So it is not that our body is our own and we are like you know, uh, in total control. In fact, it is more uh, microbes are there in the body, probably more than the cells in our body. So subclinical or inapparent infection, then there is there is no disease apparent or it doesn't reach that stage. One example would be polio. You know, if there is an infection with polio, around 100 persons, if you get infected, maybe one might develop, one or two might develop paralytic polio. And that is what we are worried about. Latent infection is another condition where uh, you have the organisms in the body for a long time. It is a different from the uh, incubation period. It's a little tricky thing. A herpes simplex one an infection is one where you will find after a long time the disease appears and then it goes 
disappears and then when the fever comes commonly known as fever blister also another example would be uh, herpes zoster where you have the uh, varicella virus in the body for uh, years together and suddenly it might appear as a uh, herpes zoster so these are uh, rare or uh, extreme or you know outliers the uh, clinical infection of course as you know where the organism the in, in, uh, entry of the organism leads to a disease host as you know is a person or a, an animal that affords subsistence or lodgment to an infectious agent under natural conditions yes we have seen that infectious disease a clinically manifest disease of man resulting from an infection contagious disease you may say uh, as a disease that is transmitted through contact again we, we sometimes use all these terms somewhat synonymously and i think mostly it does not do much harm but if you want to be very specific i mean i would suggest that we should use these things uh, in a, with the correct meaning and it will be better if you and if you want to be very specific you should use it, the correct term no like contagious disease maybe infe- i mean it's infectious of course but you know if you use the term contagious contagious disease it means it is spreading through contact communicable disease is again a broad term an illness due to specific infectious agent or toxic products capable of being directly or indirectly transmitted from man to man animal to animal or you know, from environment to man or animal so this is again you know, there is some kind of overlap between uh, these terms but uh, as i said as far as possible we should try to use the term the appropriate term so that there is not much of ambiguity or room for confusion epidemic i'm sure all of you must have heard this and have learned this again is the unusual occurrence in a community or a region of a disease or a specific health related event clearly in excess of expected occurrence now this is a little way because it says clearly in excess but if we don't talk about numbers here so that again depends on the disease that we are discussing now if the see disease is serious even a small increase you can call it as an epidemic but if it is a minor disease like a common cold or all those kind of illness if you keep on going after or naming something as an epidemic then you know you are in for trouble because it is not a issue of calling something an epidemic when you say there is an epidemic that means there is an unusual occurrence you have to do something about it it is like a murder you know you cannot call something as homicide and just leave it there so once you label something as an epidemic you are responsible who are responsible for labeling it will have the responsibility to do something about it also means find out the reason and try to control it now if you have a very good surveillance system and good numbers then there is a arbitrary limit of two standard errors from the epidemic frequency that can be used as a threshold for calling it as an epidemic for common disease but again there is no hard and fast rule it depends on the disease and it also depends on the condition you know suppose you have facilities to investigate an epidemic you may still investigate an epidemic of minor disease but suppose your hands are full with major problems serious disease here and there as a public health person in in the uh, say the administration then you may not want to add to the problem or the <clears throat> general feeling of fear you know in the community by adding another disease also into the epidemic list just because the numbers are a little more so it is it somewhat subjective but you have to take into account you know the disease the place the condition the facilities available and what you would do once you call it as an epidemic endemic is a disease where there is a constant presence of a, a infectious agent or a disease within a geographical area or population group without importation from outside so you you may not find the disease all the time but the organism is circulating in that community so sooner or later somebody will get the disease but by and large you will find someone or other suffering from the disease but the numbers will be rather kind of small generally that is the general impression but you can still have a disease which is very rampant and still be called an epidemic it used to be polio and all used to be like endemic in up and bihar for a long time so hyperendemic is where the presence of the disease at a higher incidence or prevalence rate polio endemic is conditions in which there is a high level of infection affecting mostly children so that the adults are less affected one example would be malaria and you probably most of you may not need all this uh, hair splitting uh, terms 
unless you are into public health or in in, in charge of some uh, department, uh, let's say health department. But otherwise, for clinicians, I don't think it would be necessary to know about is hyperendemic and holoendemic. But if you know there is a disease and endemic, you know you will keep in mind one of the diseases as a as your um, differential diagnosis. That is important. Sporadic state in which the disease occurs irregularly from time to time and generally infrequently. So this can be an epidemic also, sorry, an endemic also a disease, you know, where you find a disease once in a while. Now, if you ask me how to distinguish between epidemic and sorry, an endemic disease and a sporadic disease, I think it will be a little difficult for me to give a good example, but you probably you can uh, use it in that context and I don't think it is very different. Pandemic, of course, I don't have to tell you about pandemic these days. Everybody is well aware of the pandemic. Can, you know? So it's an epidemic usually affecting a large proportion of the population occurring over a wide geographical area, the uh, corona epidemic, which is currently going on. So sorry, pandemic is another good example. Influenza used to be the common example earlier. But now we have this corona or COVID. Zoonosis is another term that is frequently used, especially even now also. Uh, when we had the Nipa uh, outbreak also, we were, I use the term outbreak. Outbreak is used also for uh, synonymously with uh, epidemic. Zoonosis is an infection or infectious disease transmissible under natural conditions from vertebrate animals to man. I'm sure all of you are familiar with many of those zoonotic diseases and rabies is the one that comes to your mind first and again for uh, reasons very unfortunate reasons recently uh, we have a large number of rabies cases and a few deaths also and rabies case means invariably death so this is a uh, especially in kerala these days you know being a lot of controversy about the vaccine and whether they are vaccinated and such things then there are many other diseases hydatid disease plague and all, all examples of zoonotic disease then coming to nosocomial infection, probably most those who are in the clinical side will be interested in this nosocomial infection, where that is a hospital acquired. It's an infection occurring in a patient while in a hospital or other healthcare facility. So this I'm sure all of you are aware of it and are trying strenuously to avoid such infection because it leads to more morbidity and more expense, more hospital admission time and such problems. It denotes a new disorder unrelated to the patient's primary condition associated with being in the hospital. That means the patient got the disease because he came to the hospital, right? A condition that was not present or incubating at the time of admission to the hospital. So if a patient walks in and gets a chickenpox the next day, it won't be a hospital or a nosocomial infection because obviously uh, the incubation period of chickenpox is more than one day. So it, the patient, got the infection outside somewhere and then manifested while during hospital that is not a nosocomial infection. And at the same time, a patient gets discharged from the hospital and next day he develops the disease. Again, uh, but even if he's not in the hospital, still it is a nosocomial infection because the patient got infected from the hospital. So that is the key point where the infection occurring in a patient while in hospital, irrespective of whether the manifestation occurring uh, while in the hospital or not. This is one important challenge for most clinicians in the uh, hospital because, you know, we don't want anybody uh, to develop a disease other than what they are in for. You know, that leads to complications. It means makes the patients, the primary condition probably more severe or serious and the hospital say longer, expenses more and all sorts of issues. And we have a lot of mechanisms to control and keep this so, primary infection is uh, under control. The infection controls uh, committee and all are very important roles to play. Then we have what is called the opportunistic infection, where an infection by an organism takes the opportunity provided by a defect in the host defense to infect the host and cause the disease. I'm sure uh, all of you know where the immunity is down, you know, like a patient on chemotherapy for a malignancy or uh, strong doses of steroids or a uh, transplant patient on immunosuppressive drugs, all these patients are having their 
normal <clears throat> immune system suppressed uh, or damaged. And then, you know, the organisms otherwise would not have caused a problem will <clears throat> cause a disease in them. Then we have another term, iatrogenic uh, disease, or that is physician-induced uh, disease. Any adverse consequence resulting from a preventive, diagnostic, or therapeutic intervention by a doctor. Or for, well, not only a doctor, any healthcare provider. So this is again something that we have to be very careful to make sure that you know one of the most important uh, what do you call responsibility for us is to you know not to do harm. So people won't take it lightly, you know, when something happens due to the consequence of what we have done. Even though we must have done it in good intention, but, but you know we have to be very very careful. Some examples are an abscess we by doing even injection or a nerve injury. And like I was in this polio surveillance for some time, so I've seen a quite a number of sciatic nerve injuries. You know, when they give injection to the luteal region without <clears throat> looking for that landmass. In fact, I've seen a, one of you radial nerve injuries also, where they didn't take care, you know, to get into the muscle mass of the deltoid. So these are all probably unforgivable you know, mistakes on our part, on which we should be. Yeah, so then reaction to reaction to drugs. Sometimes it is when I mean, you can't help it, but sometimes you know you make a mistake by giving the wrong drug or the wrong injection or the wrong route. And in such instances, it will be a tragedy. So we have to be careful about that. Eradication is a term used where all the <clears throat> transmission is terminated by, by the extermination of the infectious agent through surveillance and containment. But I, I would say. Uh, the, it's better to think that the agent is eradicated rather than the disease. You know, when there is some confusion between eradication and elimination. When you don't have the disease, we call it as elimination. So still the agent may be there. One example would be polio. You know, we don't have disease of polio in India. So we can say poliomyelitis has been eliminated from India. But it is not eradicated because the agent is still there. And that is why we are <coughs> continuing with the immunization. So to... Uh, to make it simple, I would say eradication is the eradication of the agent. And again, here I would qualify, uh, all of you are aware that the smallpox has been eradicated. But technically speaking, I would say smallpox has not been eradicated because we have the agent in at least two known places, you know, one in Russia and one in America, USA. So I would say that you are eradicating the agent from the natural environment. So smallpox virus is not circulating in the natural environment. So you won't get the disease. But strictly speaking, the agent is still there under lock and key, and any mistake in that can lead to the escape of the organism and uh, uh, problem. So eradication is where you, where you have eradicated the agent, and so there is no more disease. And then you don't have to uh, take you know, worry about preventive measures. Like in smallpox, you don't immunize children against that since uh, early 80s. Then coming to some of the other terms in, used in disease transmission. We have three links in the chain of transmission. One is the reservoir, then modes of transmission, then the susceptible host. You can put it as graphically. So the agent has to reach from the source of the reservoir to the susceptible host by some mode of transmission. So you can prevent the disease or the infection by interrupting the modes of transmission, which is the most easy thing to do. So the starting point for any communicable disease existence of a reservoir or source of infection. If there is no reservoir or no source, then there is no disease. So source of infection is defined as a person, animal, object, or substance from which an infectious agent passes or is disseminated to the host. I hope I am, you can hear me and clearly any questions at this stage? Any comments? Mm, no. Okay. So we'll continue. So reservoir is defined as any person, animal, orthoprot, plant, soil, or substance, or a combination of these in which an infectious agent lives and multiplies 
and on which it depends primarily for survival and where it reproduces itself in such manner excuse me that it can be transmitted to the susceptible host so the so far is that living or non living thing in which the on which the agent primarily depends on survival the source and the survivor may not always be the same you know your the source of infection may not be the same as the survivor of the agent for example the man is a survivor for hookworm but the source of infection is soil you no know? the hookworm has to live in the human intestine for primarily for survival but you don't get into infected directly from a human being but you know you will infection is get from the uh, larvae that is present in the soil there are three types of reservoirs like human reservoir animal reservoir and reservoir in non living things like soil as you know for most human cases I mean, diseases man is in a population or study group identified as having the particular disease health disorder or condition it is called a case and now i have taken all these definitions from the park textbook of preventive medicine so i think that is a accepted textbook so i use the uh, exact terms or sentences here so it is further subdivided into clinical subclinical and latent now clinical is very clear having clinical signs and symptoms or and or symptoms now subclinical where there are here i think there is a i mean i would like to disagree with this because if you you can call something as a subclinical infection but you cannot call somebody as a subclinical case because to the some sign or symptoms of disease so this term is used subclinical infection i think i mean, I mean the case is very often used but somehow i disagree with it we can uh, because this this term of subclinical case subclinical infection is fine you know that could be a stage where there was an infection and the person has not suffered from the disease and it can be a source of uh, infection for others latent infection there are no signs or symptoms but do not infect others you know until they develop the disease so there is a slight difference there like as i mentioned earlier a person with uh, a is very have a soster will not cause chicken pox to others but if that person develops a soster that person can infect it uh, and then they can others others can develop uh, chicken pox from such a person in fact uh, i got uh, chicken pox during my final year exam mbbs exam from my friend who was very careless because he knew he had herpes zoster and then so in his, not uh, yeah herpes zoster and then he was he didn't he covered it up and my friend got it and then i got it and uh, luckily i didn't lose a year because i could i recovered before the practical exam so latent infections don't cause disease i mean infect others but if they develop the disease can cause the disease in others then we have a the group of carriers no. uh generally we look at them as very dangerous people and you know all of you all, many of you must have heard that you know, typhoid mary who, who that poor lady was put in jail i suppose you know, because she was allegedly causing um, typhoid in other among uh, to others so an infected person or animal <clears throat> that harbors a specific infectious agent in the absence of clinical disease and serves as a potential source of infection for others so carriers are less infectious than patients but may be more dangerous you know this term using the term dangerous um, makes it you know, people a little uh, hostile to people who could be potentially you know infective hmm? because you know though they are not uh, many a time responsible for that you know you look at them as you know, kind of a um, dangerous person who's going around spreading disease and death and they can spread disease without the person others being aware of this fact so carriers you have a different types of carriers we we'll look into that so the characteristics of carrier state are you know only when only then you will call them as a carrier presence of the disease agent in the body absence of 
recognizable symptoms or signs and or signs of the disease and the uh, agent is being uh, the patient sheds the agent through some discharge or excretion which can infect others so only if this is there you will call them a carrier the related infection is technically not a carrier because they are not infecting others now i think uh, there are large number of carriers i think i have uh, skipped it you know in incubatory carrier convalescent carrier i mean uh, uh, what is it called uh, long term carrier short term carrier such things are there uh, which is some diseases you know some chronic carrier you know some hepatitis b and sometimes in typhoid you may have a chronic carrier and most people will be incubatory carriers obviously because they don't know that they're having the they they are in the incubation period and they may be infecting others then some of them may be convalescent carriers they may have recovered from the disease but may still be some of them may be acute or short term others may be chronic carriers you know you can classify them depending and you can also classify them based on the route of transmission you know so they are, they are uh, can be described in many forms then let us come back to the modes of transmission so this is a very important uh, point of uh, important issue when we are talking about communicable disease we want to know the mode of transmission then it is quite e relatively easy you know to kind of interrupt that mode the transmission and then prevent the spread of the disease so it can be classified as direct transmission and indirect transmission now under direct transmission is direct contact droplet infection contact with soil inoculation into skin or mucosa and vertical transmission or transplanted transmission then you have the indirect transmission it can be vehicle borne vehicle borne and you are not referring to the motor vehicle when you are talking about water or those inanimate or, or objects then vector borne like it can be mechanical or biological then it can be air borne droplet nuclei or dust then fomite borne Uh, unclean hands and fingers. So these are the indirect modes of transmission. Now let us look at the direct transmission. I'm sure all of you are familiar with this. And nothing new about this. Only thing is, we may probably not using these terms very often or on a regular basis. So this will refresh your memory. And, and, and direct contact, contact with skin, or uh, mucus by touching, and all sexually transmitted diseases are uh, by direct contact. Then you have droplet infection. There is a direct projection of the droplet during sneezing or coughing. You know, you have sneeze or cough, and the small invisible droplets land on the other person's, you know, body or in the respiratory or the system, or nose or the mouth, and then can cause the disease. So droplets less than five microns can reach the alveoli directly. Droplets can reach only sixty to seventy meters, so only persons very near will be affected. So if you keep a distance from the person who is coughing or sneezing you are not at risk of directly getting infected by that patient then contact with soil we have already seen one example on hookworm tetanus and other then inoculation into skin the other one is like direct contact with the skin because you you don't get the injury to the skin to uh, inoculate the organism but in when this mode of transmission there is inoculation into the skin you know deep into into the skin or subcutaneous tissue rabies you know when the dog bites you or if it's a dog licks you on a intact skin normally there is no risk of developing any you know, rabies disease like hepatitis b also and generally if there is the skin is intact even there there no microscopic uh, injury on the skin even a blood is infected with hepatitis b will not cause it but if you have minor abrasion which may not be visible to the eye may cause uh, you know i mean the spread of the disease then of course the needle stick injuries are then transplacental obviously or you know many diseases that can transmit or vertically from mother to child fetus or baby rubella syphilis or many many such uh, conditions now coming to the indirect so i think we have seen uh, direct contact droplet infection contact with soil inoculation to skin and transplanted transplacental transmission indirect vehicle borne is water and food no i think i said it wrong earlier what i said was fomite not the vehicle 
uh, vehicle bond is food and water right if any food if, if any food or water is contaminated and it leads to infection it is called a vehicle bond transmission then you have vector bond you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sure all of you are familiar about the vector bond this is malaria comes to your mind you know, without thinking then we have dengue then so many other diseases which are filariasis and chicken guinea so many of diseases are there vector borne diseases and the vector borne can be further classified into mechanical biological and the biological can be even further classified as propagative and you know cyclopropagative other things you know, this probably is not very important uh, for all uh, clinicians. This is probably necessary for those who are directly involved in the control of the disease. You should know exactly how the, uh, the transmission occurs. But for others, it only matters whether the mosquito is biting you. You, do, you don't have to worry whether it is cyclopropagative or um, uh, propagative. It doesn't matter. As long as you get the disease from the mosquito, you you have to make sure that the mosquito doesn't bite you or take measures to prevent the breeding of mosquito. But for entomologists and others you know, who are more into the uh, public health aspect, you should know a little more about the uh, transmission and uh, the, act, I mean, the process of the transmission. Mechanical, the infectious agent is transported by the feet, which is contaminated. So the house fly, uh, a good example, where it sits on some contaminated material and then comes and sits on your food and then it can uh, contaminate the you know, food. Biological the infectious agent undergoes replication or development or both in a vector and requires an incubation period before the vector can transmit. So the mosquito bites an infected person and in the next instant, if it bites another person, it won't transmit the disease. Of course, in fact, the mosquito will not bite it because the mosquito is not biting it for fun. So they will bite only when it becomes uh, hungry you know, for the next feed. So the nature has its way. So between the feeds, you know, the mosquito has enough time or the parasite has enough time to uh, get ready to infect or get you know, other persons. So propagative, the agent merely multiplies in a vector, you know, that is a plague vessel. Cyclopropagative in malaria, there, there is a, uh, there's a process occurring, biological changes occurring and also multiplication. And uh, this cyclical change, is occurring in filariasis. There is no multiplication occurring in uh, filariasis in the agent while they are in the mosquito. So these are some of the ways in which the vector spreads the disease. Then there are other vectors also, you know, for diseases like schistosomiasis and guinea worm disease. Huh? But those are rare and not common here, so we are not going into those. We are mostly worried about the mosquitoes. You know, we heard enough of diseases that can be spread by mosquitoes. Then we have the airborne transmission droplet nuclei, a tiny particles that represent the dried residue of droplets. The person sneezes or coughs, and those you know, micro particles of your mucus or saliva will fall in the environment and rise and becomes a droplet nuclei, or it forms on the settle on the floor and become part of the dust. And then the wind can blow, and then you can get infected. But I'm not uh, very sure like how serious it is. Like, you know, it has to, unless you're staying very close to the people. You know, if you are in a, uh, coming across somebody in a place where there's a lot of ventilation, those things will not happen so efficiently. So if you are living in an ill-ventilated, overcrowded room, all this becomes important in spreading the disease. And that is the importance of having a well-ventilated room and avoiding overcrowding, all these airborne diseases risk of it will become less. Then you have diseases that are born by fomites. Fomites are inanimate articles or substance other than water and food contaminated by infectious discharges from the patient, like clothes, towels, cup, spoon, you know, you name it. These days it can be mobile phones or laptops or whatever it is. So these are the substances on which the, the door handles, all of them can act as fomites. Then you have unclean hands and fingers. No, needless to say, hands are the most common medium by which that substance are transferred to food. And it is very easy also to prevent that transmission by the simple process of washing your hands before eating. 
Then another term that is important would be the portal of entry. Again, these are all important when you're talking about uh, the infectious disease, you know, chemical disease and trying to control it. Yeah. Portal of entry is the place of entry of the agent into the host. And some of them are very uh, straightforward and clear, you know. But there are diseases in which the portal of entry is still a big mystery. I, I would say an example would be leprosy. You know, despite having many, many decades or probably centuries of uh, experience and research, still there is a lot of confusion as to exactly how the lepra bacilli enters a person. You know, there are, they say, direct contact is one. Others, I mean, sometimes there is proof saying that it is through the mucosa. These are all still scope for research and improvement in our knowledge, which will definitely help in controlling these diseases better. Portal of exit is a route of escape for the agent from the host into the environment or to another host. So again, these are also very important to know uh, what is the portal of entry and portal of exit for effective infection control. Otherwise, you will be doing things um, arbitrarily or by guesswork or blind. Then we have another term that I'm sure all of you are familiar with incubation period. But what I found is, you know, even though all of us know what is incubation period, but if you ask to define it on an exam, then many of us make a mistake. No, no, you, you, you take it a little casually. You no, know? uh, so this is very important, at least from the exam point of view. It is a time interval between the invasion by an infectious agent and appearance of the first sign or symptom of the disease. So this has to be very clear. In the sense, people tend to say appearance of symptoms or signs and symptoms and signs. And then it is all wrong. So it is the time interval between the entry of the organism and appearance of the first sign or symptom of the disease, whichever is first. So the second one is, again, definitely not the uh, time interval where you calculate the incubation period. Median incubation period is the time required for 50% 50, 50 of the cases to occur following exposure. Uh, again, when, when we talk about incubation period, what we are talking about average or the mean incubation period, you know, mean or median or something. Average, you know, 10 days or 2 weeks. So this is roughly the average, not the, because the correct incubation period is a range. You know, it may vary from 5 days to 25 days or so, or 10 to 30 days or so. So it may be very difficult to, for us to remember and uh, use it also. So we use, generally use the average incubation period. The, the duration of incubation period, again, is depend, determined by the infective dose. If there is a large amount of organisms entering the host, then the incubation period will be shorter, obviously. Generation time, portal of entry, and the individual susceptibility. So all these things will matter when uh, you have you decide what will be the duration of the incubation period. So, you know, one rabies, rabies is a good example where if the bite is on the foot, the incubation period will be longer. But if it's on the face or on the hands, it can be very, very short. And so, you know, you, you, you tailor your preventive measures accordingly. So if you suspect that you have a very short incubation period, you cannot save the patient with the uh, active immunization or vaccine. Then you may have to give a passive immunity also, as you will do in tetanus and rabies. And generally, there is a minimum incubation period for all diseases before the disease can occur. Shortest incubation period. And obviously, as I said earlier, the incubation period may vary from person to person. The incubation period is also used, uh, very useful when you're talking about the different types of epidemics, you know, common source, single exposure epidemic, or common source, multi uh, continuous. So, uh, single source, uh, continuous exposure epidemic, propagated epidemic, all these things you will be able to distinguish by looking at the incubation period. For example, in a common source, single exposure incubation, I mean, uh, epidemic, all the cases will occur in one incubation period. And when I say one incubation period, I'm not talking about just one uh, duration of one particular duration. What I mean is the cases will occur within the Minimum to the maximum incubation period. It will not go beyond that. If it goes beyond that, it is not a single exposure epidemic. You know, let us say if the uh, incubation period is from five days to 25 days, 
all the cases will occur between five and 24 days. That is what I mean, one incubation period. So if you look at the epidemic curve, you know, you can draw an epidemic curve, uh, then you will know what type of uh, out epidemic or outbreak it is you know, in, when you're investigating an outbreak or an epidemic. And this helps you, this knowledge about the incubation period, where you have to know the incubation period to see how much back you have to go. Suppose you're investigating an epidemic of a, uh, let us say hepatitis uh, A, where the incubation period is about, maximum incubation period is about 40 days. You know, you'll have to go back 40 days from the date of onset to know what are the sources of infection if that person might have been exposed to. And that is a very tough job. And so unless you know the, the longest incubation period, you will not be able to do a proper investigation of the epidemic. So these are all uh, important uh, applications of knowing the incubation period. The latent period, I think we already discussed a little bit about it earlier, but for communicable disease, this is what we are using, even though for, sorry, non-communicable disease. In the communicable disease, it is a use for certain conditions like herpes zoster and so. But again, here, this latent period and all is a little very vague because you never know where the exact disease has started and when it is showing up as a, a symptom or sign. So that is where sometimes, you know, when you're talking about screening for disease, this is becomes very important. Otherwise, you know, you may get a, a wrong impression that you have diagnosed the disease early and, you know, you think the patient has survived longer because of your screening, which may not be correct. Then another term, which is the communicable period is the time dur during which the infectious agent may be transferred from an infected person to another person, from an infected person to an animal or in all the other things. Now, this is also very uh, relevant because, you know, sometimes we panic when you diagnose a disease in a patient. And there is no point in getting alarmed once the patient is diagnosed. You know? Because the person has been in infective until the time you were, uh, I mean, uh, I mean you, till the time you examine, diagnosed. Once you're diagnosed, you can be more careful. So like for tuberculosis, you know, you sometimes some, you, the person has been probably infecting uh, for a long time. So there is no need to be alarmed because once you diagnose a disease in a person, of course, you have to take appropriate care, but you don't have to, you know, kind of isolate the person or, you know, <clears throat> lock him up just because you know that person is having the disease, which is unnecessary. You are, now that you know, you'll be a little more careful. And that person has been infecting others or the family members till the time at the previous day. So the communicable period is important, but it is not, not a reason to panic or, you know, to punish or, you know, take irrational measures. It's because, you know, somebody has a disease. Then the communicable period may vary from slightly before the onset of the disease and the convalescence. You know, some of them have the maximum in, in infective period just before the occurrence of symptoms. That is the late uh, incubation period and the early you know, clinical uh, picture. And then some of them may continue to be infected before the entire duration of the disease and also sometimes for the uh, convalescent period. And as we have discussed early, uh, if they have become a carrier, you know, they may recover from the disease and continue to infect others without them being aware and also others not being aware of it. Rarely, it happens rarely, but hepatitis B is a common uh, condition in which you can have chronic carriers. Typhoid, maybe for a few days or so, and there may be other diseases also like that. Then another term is uh, herd immunity. This is again a little bit um, controversial term. You know, uh, I feel different people use these terms a uh, different way. But I will stick to what is given in the book. So we will not. It is the level of the immunity of a population or community. Here the herd is referring to, I mean, normally we don't call human beings a herd. We refer it to animals, you know, herd of sheep or cow. But the term is somehow it may be used for human beings also. I mean, in, in the context of um, immunity. Herd immunity is the uh, level of immunity of a population or a community. If most of the members of the community are immune, we can say the herd immunity is high. 
Now, this is where the problems arise, you know. Another benefit of the high herd immunity is that susceptible individuals surrounded by immune individuals will have less risk of infection. Now, how exactly will the susceptible individual be surrounded by immune individuals is anybody's guess. You know, if, no, this is one of the, I mean, again, I will, this is a very, as I said, this is a very controversial issue or a topic or a concept. You know, people blame those who are not vaccinated because they say, you know, they are the source of infection or you might have heard, you know, you should have 90% or 95% vaccination coverage beyond which there will be no, or that you can eliminate the disease. So these are all theoretically, it is there, but I mean, these are all based on herd immunity. But it is not that the say, this principle that saying that susceptible, if a herd immunity is there and it will protect a susceptible individual, might be working if there is a uniform kind of distribution of you know, immune or protected immune individuals. And you have a few and immune people in their midst, maybe they may. But that is, we don't know who is immune and who is not immune. So it is not like, you know, where do you have a, a VIP, you know, where you're surrounded by security guards, you know, so that you know, no, nobody can harm that person. I, I don't think it works that way. But by and large, it is said that if you have a very high herd immunity, you can quickly eliminate certain diseases. And you can achieve that by human vaccination, and you know, and but uh, it, it has not happened uh, so easily. It is not that easy because that level of immunity, like earlier when we were talking about uh, measles elimination in the beginning, you know, in the seventies and eighties, it was thought believed that if you, you know, this herd immunity concept has arise, I mean, is because you find whenever there is an epidemic. You know, not all members will be affected. I think this is true for almost all communicable disease. You know, as we know, the immunity depends on not only just the previous exposure, your innate immunity. Then there are many factors which goes into uh, whether a person will suffer from the disease or not. I mean, the, the dose of infection, you know, that, that immune status or the nutrition status, and you know, all so many things are there. So for most diseases, I think almost for almost all diseases. Even if there is, if a disease is introduced into a so-called virgin community, still not all people will uh, suffer from the disease. You know, there, there, there will be a rapid rise in the a number of cases. And most, if it is a propagated disease, you know, a large number of people will be in, I mean, affected. And then the epidem epidemic, uh, the outbreak will die down. And it will definitely leave a lot of people without causing the disease. So this is the theoretical uh, what do you call concept on which the herd immunity is based. So we hope that if you can artificially in, in, induce immunity by vaccin vaccinating a large proportion of people, there will be no disease outbreak or, or we may even be able to eliminate the disease. But it doesn't work that simple, even though or theoretically, or in nature, it happens that some people will be spared. You know, if, if, if about 80 90 percent of the people are in, infected or suffer from the disease, the outbreak will just die on its own, sparing the others. So, it was thought in the beginning when the measles vaccine was you know, synthesized, you know, if we immunize around 70 percent, 80 percent, we will be able to eliminate the disease. But then it did not happen. Then either that slowly the herd immunity level was raised to 90, 95. Still, you know, a lot of um, measles cases occurring. Anyhow, this is a concept that is widely talked about. Then we talk about controlling or eliminating disease or preventing disease. You know, if we have a very high level of herd immunity, it will protect allegedly. I would say those who are not immune or immunized in that way. So that is in brief about some of the concepts of infectious disease epidemiology that we discussed today. 
So these are some of the fundamental concepts, and then one should be aware of this and use the terms correctly, so that you know you convey the correct meaning. Or you, you if you are planning some kind of a control measure, you, know, you are very clear about what is the basis for it. What is you know if you are talking about incubation period, or the mode of infection, or mode of transmission, or what is the source of the portal of entry, portal of exit. All these things are important if you have to really. Uh, thoroughly understand the disease and take appropriate measures to prevent the disease. So that is all from my side. And now I think if you have any questions or comments, you are welcome to ask me or give your comments. I don't suppose anybody has any doubts, sir. Uh, yeah, thank please. you so much for uh, the session today. Right. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you all. Right. It's too late for discussions. Yeah? Right. I agree. <laughs> yes, sir. It is. Okay. So, okay. Can we end the session now? Yes, sir. Certainly. Yeah. Okay. Right. right. Yeah. Thank right. you so much, sir. Right. Yeah.